Hi, I'm Hilary Sedaris. Um, I, um, I was born in Warsaw, Indiana. Um, my, on my father's side, um, my grandparents came from, my grandmother came from Kios, and my grandfather, um, who was Greek, came from, from Turkey near Izmir. Um, around the, I would say in the, during the 20s. Um, so my father was first American Greek, um, first generation, I should say. Um, so I'm just gonna get into the poems. I have, i um, gonna read from five uh, of my books about, I'm gonna read about four or five poems from each one, um, going, starting from 2014 to, uh, to, uh, to 2020, where we are now. Um, so the first book I'm going to read from is called Sweet Flag. It's, it was published by, it's a chat book by Finishing Line Press. And the poems are all um, addressed to and, and titled with herbs or plants. Um, so I'll start with Dill. Dill. Wool in Norse, you increase and induce mother's milk and sleep, little fennel with your branched taproot. Weird sisters hasten from the man who wears a sack of you over his heart, humming a Swedish hymn, doubles his luck at catching salmon. So these herbs, there's a lot of folklore, etymology, myth um, that, that is in the narrative. So uh, they're actually very lyrical poems, but I've worked in some um, mythology and um, I guess, uh, as I was saying, history, mythology, um, superstition, tarragon. The true French can't be grown from seed. Online they sell the Russian kind. Tasteful, pale, willowy, a beauty useless in the kitchen. Your French, a deeper, glossy green and sharp, some even say biting. I propagate when your shoots show, gently disentangle your roots. It's the damp, not the cold that kills. Time. Greek for courage or fumigate, your singed leaves drive blue bottle, flies from castle and hovel. Vermifuge, carminative, you're everywhere like God in cough syrup, clam chowder, Benedictine bitters, hookworm cures in sprigs or mints on cherry tomato halves. Cypress. Star differs from star in splendor, says St. Paul, so we don't plant the body that will be only the seed. Egyptians liked your trunk for coffins, Cretans carved wands from your branches, passed them over afflicted limbs. Early Christians lined graves with your sprigs to speed the final trump. The eye blinks change. And the last one I'll read from this chapbook is Oregano. Joy grew wild on Greek mountainsides, a two-lipped pinkish flower easing an aging matron's size. Pliny advised a poultice of your leaves for sprains, court scorpion and spider bites. Bald men applied your balm to sun-baked scalps, your hearty, hairy stem, giving them hope. It's 
So I'm going to move on to um, the next book I wrote, which is called The Inclination to Make Waves. It was published by Big Wonderful Press in 2016. And all the poems in it are four letter words. The titles are four letter words. And um, it is uh, the, the narrative um, comes through the four letter words the different etymologies and meanings of these words. So I'll start with good. Report card B, commodity. Food long in the fridge, unspoiled. Antonym and origin of evil. Grade of kisser in the kissed mouth's mind. The news I'm leaving, you decide what kind. What for? Assign the qualifier. Pretty, very, no. You never had it so. And the poems are all in couplets in this book as well. So, a couple, um, three or four more in this book. Move. The next one is move. What woolens do slowly in summer, planets around suns, tear jerkers and home wreckers, cause, arouse, sell merchandise. There'll be no more dwelling on eviction. Even at a loss, now everything must go. Wise to hire a lawyer smooth across a dance floor, meaning of excuse me on a rush hour train. Flat. It got too smooth, too even, but we lacked the inclination to make waves across a range of frequencies. It stayed the same below true pitch in song. It was one story in a house. I lived with you. It went like that. Bend. Just as the word is mostly end, We've reached this path where brittle leaves crack underfoot, and we admit it's late for flexibility, for faith that we can break so many times and mend. No, I'll just read. Um, I'll read two more from this from this book. What? Today I called the kettle a bottle, my daughter by my sister's name. I stumbled over antic, how it's almost antique. Reached in my deep purse for what do you call it? Lipstick, toothpick, mint. Not as I thought, but how I meant. One more from the four letter word book, sage, also an herb. I've lived long enough to cultivate these silvered leaves, to pluck what uses wisdom has, to prune my salvia in spring, savoring age, the not unpleasant sting of being healed not saved. Well, the next book I'm going to read from um, is a full length book that sort of covers a, a longer period in my life when I met my husband who is Italian and it's called Un Amore Veloce, uh, Fast Love. Um, and a lot of these poems have Italian words and phrases in them. And I really love the cover of this poem. 
watercolor by an artist in Prague. These poems deal with um, failures to communicate, misunderstandings, misinterpretations, and sort of interlanguage um, between people who don't exactly speak each other's language 100%. Um, and there are, there is also um, the language of the child in the earlier poems of this book. So I'll start with um, start with a poem called Geometry, which um, is a sonnet. Geometry. How can you be the one who called the table of contents? The plate of compliments sang like a diaper in the sky, drank formula from a baba. Tonight we cram isosceles, scalene, and how a rhombus differs from a square. I love your getting wavy hair, the way your lashes graze the page, their half moon curve just like your dad's. I don't know which I prefer math from your mouth or your notepads, definition of a line, the part where it goes on in both directions forever. And that poem was actually included in, in the anthology Pomegranate Seeds, um, an anthology of Greek American poetry edited by Dean Postos Nino. Nikos is also in that anthology. Okay, going back to an earlier poem in this book. Pronouns. He told me he couldn't follow my telling because of my problem with pronouns, he said. It bothered him really the way I assumed. He knew who my he and she were. Did I expect him to read my mind? He wouldn't play games. He'd been there, done that. It bothered him really the way I assumed. He'd been there when clearly he hadn't. There are also a few saints in this book. So this is Augustine. What did he love in those days but his theft? Not for their shape or taste, but for the act of plucking them did he devour those stolen pears sweetened by sin. Itching with passions in his 16th year, he would confess. He was enamored of error, error itself, not what he erred for. This is spilupo. Um, it's an Italian word and it will become clear in the poem, its meaning. What a weird word looked at too long in my easy Italian companion at the Church Avenue station. Definitions I daydream, holy sieve, svelte wolf. The F doors open, a hirsute man bearing the news in Urdu shuffles off, elbows akimbo as I Google svilupo, development. There goes church, spelled out on terracotta tiles, all ch and o. And a couple of other poems from Unamore Veloce. Fuoco. Every day my love burns down the house almost 
Lamoka on the stove, then off for a walk or soccer match. If I accuse him, he admits I'm right. Why fight about a fire not burning anymore? Oh, yeah. I have one more thing. This book. To my husband looking for his hat. Autumn began this way, a good or bad day, depending on your language, to lose a hat on given wind velocity and grief. Your mother rode the tram in circles rather than go home when all her friends were gone, you've told me more than once. You left your Forza Roma on a cross town 57, seeking Alexander Calder, needing neither air conditioning nor heat. I sneaked a cigarette before we met. You said my sweater smelled strange. Bad? You shrugged. Eh. Um, I have two more books um, that I'll read a few poems from. Uh, this next one is a chapbook from Dos Madres Press. It came out in 2019. Um, these are like the four letter word poems. Um, the titles are a single word although some of them are longer than four letters. Um, but in general, they are in couplets. They are small lyrical poems in couplets with one word titles. Word. Pain began in language when I looked at dog and saw God and the highway sign for Tulsa as Altus. Even in the bluebird group, I lagged, slow to tell time, know my right from my left hand. Teachers scrawled daily in red on my baby essays. Sometimes I whispered when I read to hold the letters in my head. Retard, they said. Cell. Robert Hooke looked through his microscope into the rooms of Christian monks. Malcolm read the dictionary, aardvark to zygo. In her bedroom laboratory, Rita Levy Montalcini saw how each divides to form more cells, goes forth and multiplies legless, propelled by its flagellum through chaos while, while hiding from the Nazis in her parents' Turin house. Three more of them. Well, I should say the book is called The Silent Bee. And um, the first poem in the book is Dumb. And the last one is numb. So those are sort of the bookends um, and sort of exploring the, um, the life of, of words and letters that are silent but still linger like a, like a limb that has been lost. Gaff. Of course, the word for what she did, for how she felt, was French, fucked up. As sure as she opened the door, a mental lapse or lingual slip, the mouth of youth contains such pure chagrin. How many synonyms for shame, dommage, or honte? How many shades of red to turn before she can? look back and laugh. Um, this is North, five letter word. The de dictionary definition 
is um, from Miriam Webster. The direction of the North terrest terrestrial pole, the direction to the left of one facing east. In your country, as in mine, the ones above look down on those below, top notch to rock bottom. North outranks south, though it declines to mean, depends on what you face. Rome slams Naples, Milan shuns Rome. I like how in Italian I can say, continuo a non capire. I continue to not understand. Earth spins at a tilt. How else? There's no upright in space. And one more from here. Mint, M-I-N-T. Brilliant, unwise, you bike across the bridge, pedal uptown, hip hop in your earbuds, at ease in traffic, unfazed by backfiring trucks, cabs in your lane, in a knit cap, to the think tank where you work as old as I was when I met your dad. Last night, I didn't go to bed. I lied, lied to my husband about the cast iron pan. I looked at helmets online, your head size and shade of green. In my head. Well, that was the silent bee from Dos Madras Bliss. And I will end with some poems from my most recent book, which really just came out during the pandemic. It's called Animals in English, and it's a translation into free verse of, of the writings of and the thoughts of Temple Grandin, who um, uh, grew up with uh, Asperger's syndrome and had a great deal of difficulty learning language and and words were not her friends, uh, but she became very um, important in the field of animal psychology and animal, um, hu the humane handling of animals in slaughterhouses um, and, in other, and in other places. So these are in the voice, these poems in the voice of Temple Grand and her book, most famous book is called Animals in Translation. So this is animals in English. And it's sort of a coming of age narrative in some ways. Nantasket lights. I got kicked out of English for fighting. I remember what's her name's cheek blazing from my slap. She called me tape recorder over and over as I talked about the rotor at Nantasket. Park. I didn't think in words, still don't. I rode that tilting wheel all night. I like the way it feels to be pushed up against a wall. And when Temple Grandin was about 16, she built herself a machine that uh, put pressure on her and squeezed her um, which made her feel calm. She had a lot of anxiety and she got that inspiration from watching cows go into a chute, which held them tightly. And she noticed that they were calm and that when they were in there. So this is called squeeze chute. And the, there's a little um, quote from her book, Animals in Translation. It worked beautifully. Whenever I put myself inside, I felt calmer. I still use it today. Cows saved me. One summer in high school, I saw a herd go through the chute to get their shots. Cows, you might think, would panic when the metal cage clamps shut, but they calm down like swaddled newborns divers in wetsuits. People would disapprove, but I would build a squeeze chute of my own.
ring bit. A ring bit is a is a kind of a, a bit for a horse's um, bridle. The school for problem teens had nine horses, gorgeous, disturbed, purchased at markdown prices by our headmaster. I groomed them, swept the stable, waxed the saddle mom gave me until it gleamed to keep worry at bay, worry I can't explain. No one had done cruel things to me. I still feel Goldie's eagle gaze, the way she paused, came close, lowered and let me rub her head. I see her twisted tongue deformed by the ring bit her former owner jerked on hard, her neck lathered in fear when I chirped at her to gallop. And I will read two more from Animals in English. This, um, this comes from a, a book that Temple Grandin wrote about, about humane animal, um, humane, the humane slaughter of animals. Stunning. If you watch an animal, and it starts with a quotation from her book, if you watch an animal being slaughtered, it may be disturbing because the animal does not lie still after it is killed. And this is also a sign. Ignore the limbs. The legs may kick. Look at the head. Hit with a captive bolt, the eyes widen but lack a corneal reflex. The neck should never arch or stiffen, signs of returning or partial sensibility. The tongue and tail should hang straight down, the nose not twitch when pricked, no flinch when entering the back, properly stunned, a cow will flop and gasp less than a minute, like a fish on a slick dock. And the last one, which is actually the last one in this, in this book, um, it's called Stairway to Heaven. And it starts with a quote from Temple Grandin's um, book about the humane slaughter of, of of cattle. Stairway to heaven. I had a feeling of great satisfaction knowing that the animals were to be treated with care right to the end, but I still cried all the way to the airport. Cows think in pictures, not stories. At ease they climb the high walled ramp without prodding. At its top, a worker on the clock will shoot a bolt into each head. It curves the way herds range in spirals over land and never wonder where it ends. So thank you for inviting me to be part of this project. And um, that, that concludes my reading. Thank you very much, uh, Hilary Siveris, um, for uh, reading uh, for the Greek American uh, Poets um, project. Uh, today it is uh, Monday, uh, October 12th, 2020, and the, the Hellenic American project, uh, the Diaspora Center. Uh, intends to, you know, to, to document the voices and uh, the uh, poetry of Greek American poets. Um, so uh, the years between your latest book and the first one is about how many years, you said? Uh, the first one that I read from? Yes. Um, it's been about, let's see, from 2014, six years. Six years. Mm -hmm. um, and um, 
the latest one, uh, Animals uh, in English, uh, was published during the pandemic, you said. Uh, how, how the pandemic has uh, affected you? Also the publication of the book and also uh, writing uh, poetry during uh, you know, all this time. Um, it's been, it's been a productive time. I feel somewhat guilty saying that because I know it's been a, a terrible, terrible time for so many people and, um, has just been a tragedy and the whole state of our country is, is a tragedy right now, but uh, it's been a tr productive time because there, there, it's been an opportunity to really slow down and you know, not always be commuting from here to there. And so that, that allows for some space to really look at things, listen to things that I hadn't paid attention to before, especially in my very close uh, neighborhood and environment. So I would say it's, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been a good time for writing, although it's been a terrible time in, in so many other ways. Besides uh, the the poems, well, you know, good poetry, and you involve themes from uh, the human condition to the environment to animal rights and all this. Uh, you have very interesting titles for your books. Um, I would like to hear more about. Uh, the silence in poetry, the silent, and also the four, the four letter words. How, 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 how that came in mind? Um, I think it, with the four letter words, I think it, it sort of was inspired by the dictionary. I'm one of the books, first books that I bought when I, as an adult, when I had enough money to buy a few things was was a large unabridged dictionary and I just find the dictionary such a rich place to to find all kinds of strange um, connections between words and stories and you know etymology is also always so so interesting and I thought it's been it was a way to sort of um, you know, keep going with the writing to sort of have a project of let's do, let's try writing a, a four letter word poem every other day or, you know, every week um, to just keep going back to the dictionary and looking at, at words and not knowing what I would find or what kind of narrative might be, you know, woven into, into the story of the word. Um, it kind of also allowed me to escape from thinking about myself and telling you know a, a narrative straightforwardly about about me which i've always found hard to do so by escaping into this word and its etymology its double meanings i could sort of write something about myself without setting out to write something about myself and uh, the silent the silent b and the silent b um well, I've always been, I mean, fascinated by how, um, you know, the Anglo-Saxon words, the very, the very small, short, abrupt, and, and monosyllabic Anglo-Saxon words always seem a little bit less valued than the, than the longer um, Latin words. Um, of course, I don't, I don't speak Greek, so I, I can't speak to, to how beautiful the sounds are of the longer Greek words, but the Latin and, and Italian words, they just seem to have more cachet, more, more sophistication, even though, um, and I think that probably comes from way back in English history when the, when, when the French you know, dominated England and, and French became the court language. But I guess um, by, you know, there, so there are a lot of words in English that still have this B or, or other letters in them that are silent, that don't, um, but we still feel them there, kind of, they still linger um, in, even though they're not, they're not pronounced. And the book, um, The Silent B, 
it is kind of about power and silencing. It's just, it, there are many lyrics that, um, like the, the lyric North, um, Cell, there are a lot of um, poems that I think are about the abuse of power and how power is used to silence people and how language can also be used to silence people um, or, or a person who is dyslexic is silenced because of the uh, what's happening in the brain is not allowing that person to read so that person becomes dumb that person becomes um, you know uh, actually speechless you know uh, and ashamed so th there's a lot of working through um, shame, power, um, how schooling often affects students in really negative ways. So I think those are all kind of themes in the, in the, in the silent bee. And uh, how you usually write? You write using a, a pencil, a pen, or the computer, the paper? Um, I usually try to write on a on a like a piece of printer paper without any lines and not with a fancy pen. I try to make it very low, low expectations, <laughs> you know, or, or even so definitely not on the computer, but also um, to go to to kind of trick myself into writing into sitting down and writing. I will. Maybe I'll start sending poems to a magazine and that will make me revise them, maybe make me do some work and then I'll read some poems on that magazine's website and that'll inspire me. But I, I try not to sit down and say like today I'm going to write something. It's more like I'll send something to a magazine or I'll, I'll look at, I'll check out a magazine and then that will kind of trick me into into writing. I also really like to look at reference, all kinds of reference material, like, you know, uh, what are the different kinds of saddles that Temple Grandin might have used, or what are the, you know, or reading about the trees, or, you know, a book about trees. But there's so much rich language there that's so specific to, to pull from. You mentioned that uh, at least uh, two or three of your books are chat books, and recently we have seen a revival of chat books and recognition of their importance, uh, also in aesthetic aesthetic terms, but also valuable uh, for poets and, and, and small printing houses uh, to communicate with people, with audience and poets. Uh, how do you feel about chat books? I love chat books and, and I think it's great that there's so many small publishers that are allowing more, more poets to begin um, publishing by publishing chat books. I mean, um, my first three, my first four books were chat books and that was a way to sort of begin to tie together, you know, or to have some kind of thematic um, connection. I think a, a chapbook is a good way to start um, instead of setting out to write a longer book, you know, to, to have some kind of, again, maybe it's, for me, it was a little bit of a trick to do, to, you know, um, like Sweet Flag was, was all about herbs and plants, um, but it, it gave me a kind of regular practice and going back to that, going back to those materials and, and trying to craft, not a long book, but you know, about 20 pages. I think that's a really good way for, for poets to start. And I think it's great that there, that there's more, there are more ways to publish chapbooks and more, more publishers who are, who are doing, who are, who are publishing chapbooks. Can you give us an idea uh, where uh, the places where, where do you write the books? I mean, it was uh, the city, uh, somewhere else uh, in the country. Is, is the place important um, in order to write? Um, I, I usually do work in my in my apartment um, in Brooklyn and my small <laughs> writing space that I have. But um, 
you know, sometimes I, I've been known to, you know, stop in the middle of a, of a sidewalk and, you know, write, write some things down or try to record them on my phone. You know, as, as I'm taking a walk, I find walking is very, very good for producing writing. Um, taking walks in, in nature. The closest thing we have to actual nature is Prospect Park here. Um, but mostly in, I do my writing at home. Um, is uh, the Greek American community uh, aware of your poetry? How, how they have received your poetry? Um, I was involved for some years in the Greek American um, poetry series that, that Dean Costos ran at um, the Cornelia Street Cafe, which sadly is, not, is no more. Um, that was a wonderful place to meet other writers and it was a fun place and really the downstairs was like a separate world. I met a lot of people there when I, when I first started doing readings. And although that was the Greek American Poetry Society or po poetry reading series, most there weren't very many Greek American poets there. There were all kinds of poets who were, who were invited. Um, I did really love the work of um, Nicholas Johnson who, um, died recently. Um, I thought he was an amazing Greek American poet. Um, he, um, he was very ill um, and he died much younger than he should have, but he was very talented. Um, other than that, you know, Dean, um, I don't have, I don't really have that much of a connection to the Greek American community, maybe because I don't, I have the language. Any other comment you'd like uh, to mention about uh, your poetry and your future plans, perhaps? Um, uh, I guess I'd say right now I'm, I'm working on a new, um, hopefully full length book and a lot of it has been written during the pandemic and written about um, places very close to home in my neighborhood and people I've run into and you know who have gone through this experience with me so that's what i'm it's and because i don't usually write or i haven't written poems that are very personal and sort of true about my life in that way it feels kind of new so um, i'd also love to to translate at some point to learn more about how it works to translate. I've tried translating some poems from Italian um, and they were just terrible. <laughs> so um, I'd love to, to, when I have more time, explore the, that art. Hilesi Deris, thank you very much for participating in the reading the series of Greek American Poets in their voice. Um, and uh, I hope that to have a chance soon uh, to have an event, um, you know, uh, with physical presence, because I, I think that poets um, interact with audiences, and uh, the physical presence sometimes it is it is uh, necessary, important for for poets. But uh, thank you for doing that uh, under the new circumstances. Thank you for inviting me. I would love to, and I hope there will be a, a, an in-person event. That would be fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for including me.